Um, this is something very important. Uh, we know that carrots and presbyopia are two conditions that affect our eyes as we age. And it is very important to know that in the United States, according to the CMT, which is the Communication Media Technology, uh, people that are born in between 1946 and 1964, that we call um, boomers, and included in that group, uh, they are, almost all of them are in a digital platform. And according to the CFT, 92% use smartphones, which means that the functional vision, including a greater range of visions, is very important at this moment. And in our practice, we see an increased number of people coming for the same reason, poor vision related to cataracts. But the difference between now and in the past is now our patients, they got more information, they are very well educated, and they're more demanding now. And they really look for be glasses free. And this is the main demand that they have. Not because only or because they Google everything, because also friends tell them about their experience when they get surgery. So today they're more demanding than 25 years ago. It is, it is essential to understand that we have to see our patients as a total, uh, in a holistic way, which means that we need to take into consideration the mental status and social factors when we decide the kind of treatment that we're going to provide to our patients. So this is very essential to understand. And we have to combine objective, which is from medical history, very important previous refractive surgery, ocular surface, macula and the retina, corneal power, atismatism, biometry, and subjective, which is visual goals, lifestyle, personality, very important, profession and hobbies. If we can put all this together, we will can tailor the proper IUL for the proper person. Of course, every time you do any evaluation on a patient that you think you're going to do a multifocal or a premium IUL, there are a lot of things that you have to consider. Uh, believe it or not, there is a high prevalence of DID in the general population. There are several studies that prove that when you do tests to evaluate the dryness in people that are going to be under cataract surgery, you will be surprised that several studies came, um, came out with the same results. More than 80% of the people we will have some degree of DID. Um, when you have a DID and you don't treat it before the surgery, you will have a worse DID after the surgery. Um, the majority of the patients, they won't understand this as a DID. They will understand that this is a failure of your surgery. Uh, there is a lot of uh, ocular surface disease, like epithelial basement membrane dystrophy, pterygium, uh, S and C also are present, and we have to evaluate the patient before we decide to go for surgery. Why? Because the DID, OSM, blepharitis, and some other ocular surface conditions, they change the dynamic of the ocular surface, they can change the K readings, they can change the uh, biometric values, and of course, when everything is different and in everything is not in the correct way, your result for the IOL selection will be wrong. And same with my bone and gland dysfunction, this is very important. There is a high population of the people, as you can see, from 5 to 70 percent will have um, MGD. Tyrafil has, it is hyperosmolar, and whenever this happens, there are several studies that show that the key values change. And it's very important that you will have the correct key value to make the proper calculation. RG conjunctivitis, where I live in the Middle East, there is a lot 
in the Middle East and the north of Africa, a lot of people with allergies, and we have a lot of uh, people with diabetic retinopathy. Uh, this is very important uh, to evaluate. Uh, ocular surface disease will lead to false, or false corneal power and it will induce atismatism, which is not the correct atismatism of the cornea. Uh, there is a high prevalence, as I mentioned before, of DID in the general population. In Saudi Arabia, several studies go from 49% to 78% of people with DID. And this is a high number of people having dryness. And if you don't treat it before the surgery or before you made the calculation, the results are not gonna be the good ones. If you don't manage this, you will have an unhappy patient. Objectively, you will have refractive surprise and we will have a greater DID symptoms. So how do we prevent this? We have to follow protocols, a standardized protocol that we help to identify OSD and DID. Uh, more accurately before surgery. And it's also important to spend time with your patients explaining every single details, not only about the surgery, also about the ocular surface, also about the dryness. As I said before, especially where I live, in Riyadh, the, the humidity is 7%. It's a very, very dry environmental, and everybody, almost everybody have dry eye. So if you don't explain this to the patient, that when you do the surgery, you can make the DID worse, they will understand that this is a failure in the surgery. And they will see it more as a complication than as a previous disease. So we have to take time and explain to the patients all the possible scenarios that they will have when they get cataract surgery. Uh, either with a monofocal lens or with a, a premium IULs. This is very important. Uh, it is time consuming, but if you do this survey, you will identify patients that have DID. And this is very, very important. Uh, there are a lot of people that have DID, but they are asymptomatic. And those are the patients that the surgery is a trigger to develop a worse DID. So you have to pay attention to those patients, spend time. As I say, it's time consuming, but this is very um, super necessary before you select the patient for premium IOLs. Very important considerations. At this moment, we do not have osmolarity test, but if you do, do it. Check the osmolarity test because it tells you a lot. I do. All the patients that I'm going to do cataract surgery, I use fluorescein, I evaluate the surface. If I have a spot, I put the patient under treatment before I do all the measurements. I test the TVUT at the break of time. I test in every single patient. If it is less than 10 seconds, I will do further evaluation of the patient. And if you do the placido disc, you will see the center of the placido disc, if there is any irregularity, you have to do further evaluation of these patients. Um, we have a lot of patients that had refractive surgery. So be careful with those patients. Those patients need special consideration. I'm not saying that you cannot do premium IULs in people who already have refractive surgery, but you must select the right, and the right patient will be well central ablation bed, regular corneal atismatism, but avoid irregular atismatism, and look for high order order aberrations. Uh, this is a very nice graphic. Uh, I got it from uh, Arthur Kumin last night at 12 o'clock, and I want to credit Dr. Lance Kruger, and it points out uh, where we are based on the age of the patient. Uh, People for cataract surgery, starting at 40, you can go 40 and up, and real cataract after 65. So we have um, refracted left and shades as an alternative, and we have cataract surgery. But well, this is a very fantastic graphic that summarizes 
the population that can be that can be our candidate for cataract surgery. Now, we offer different alternatives. Yes, we can. And this is what is right now on the market. We have monofocal lens, we have premium monofocal, we have monofocal toric and no toric. We have this new generation of EDOs, enhanced EDOs, and we got multifocal IOLs. I heard somebody a week ago saying that we have more artificial tears in Spain than anywhere else, but now there are more intraocular lenses or different intraocular lenses in Spain that artificial tears. And I'm not going to be surprised if you see the amount of options that we have, it makes it a little difficult for us to decide which is the proper lens to be selected for every single patient. I have to recognize the hard work of Shiraz, Joaquin Fernandez, David, Eric, and Francesco, who have taken the time to put all this information together. There is a lot of information, and it's not only the information that they provide to you, which is very helpful, it also helps you to understand which is the proper intraocular lens for the proper patient. This is on November 2020. This is what was available at that time, and you will see the increase on the number of different IULs on the market. This is November 2020. This is March 2022. And in 2023, I can even put it in the same slice. I have to use two slides to accommodate all the lenses. Uh, this is the way the premium IUL market is behaving right now. In November 2020, 35 premium IULs. March 2022, 48 premium IULs. And April 2023, 61 premium IUL, with an increase of 74% comparing November 2020 and April 2023. And you will see an exponential number of new lenses um, from March 2022 to April 2023, a new monofocal EDOF, a new trifocal lenses, which is a lot in one year period. Okay, this is what I have available in Saudi Arabia. So when you're gonna select for your cases, you have to know what is available for you as, your, as a doctor to decide for your patient. But the situation is different when you have to decide for yourself, which is the one that you're gonna use shoes for your own eyes. So this is the question that everybody will ask you, or every single patient, which is the best IOL for me? And the answer is the same for everybody. There isn't a one size that fits all. There is no one that fits or work for everybody. As I mentioned at the beginning, you have to put everything together Objectively and subjectively, put it everything together to decide which is the right IUL for the right person. And this is very important to review uh, before you decide and select the IUL and select the patient. How much do you value being free of glasses? What, how much do you want to see? You want to only see near? You want to see intermediate? You want to see far? You want to see only far? and intermediate, there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, whether the corruption of the tismatism is required for the patient, the activity that you do, what is your current lifestyle? Of course, cost is very important as monofocal IULs are the only one covered by the majority of the insurance. Premium IULs are not covered, you have to come from your own pocket. Uh, how long, how long does it take for you to adapt? Uh, which are the daily vision needs for the patient? Uh, vision goals, expectations, and I believe that one of the most important is the personality of the patient. You have to be very careful when you offer premium IULs or when you offer a multifocal lens, and this is very important. You have to place your patient either in that size or this size of the line. 
people that is on the other side, they're going to give you problems. They're going to be very demanding. And with multifocal IULs, you have to avoid very demanding people. Uh, which is the best IUL for me? Now I'm going to speak. Uh, this is not going to be a technical lecture. It's more than an experience that you have as a patient. Uh, and I know that there is not a single multifocal or enough that will suit all the necessity of the patient. The problem is when you have several friends, I'm very lucky that I have several good friends. The majority of them are on that list. And the problem is which one will do the surgery for you? How do you do to avoid, uh, here is one of them, how do you do to avoid them to get yellow to the other one? And this is how, that was a dilemma for me, which is the right one. All of them are exceptional surgeons. All of them you can go there and get your surgery and you will be in very good hands. So I have to find a good excuse to get the surgeon. So. What a better excuse to go to the final medical school exam from my daughter in Argentina. And I know that there are very good surgeons in Argentina, but there is a less specific one that I like. So I flew from Riyadh to Paris, Paris to uh, Buenos Aires for this, with this huge excuse. But the more you remember people telling you do not get surgery because I was 2020 with glasses. I didn't need to get surgery. I just was tired of using my glasses. So that was my motivation. Even so in the plane, I said, you know, I wish I were in that plane going in the opposite direction. But I was thinking too much, I said, I gotta go to sleep again because if I keep thinking about this, I might decide not to get the surgery and I spend all the time with my daughter instead of being in the clinic. So finally I decide for, well, the owner of the clinic is here and I want to thank them because, and also Francois, uh, BBI, it was, everything was free, which is very good. So this is Gerardo Balbeca, he's an excellent and amazing surgeon. So this is me before the surgery, I'm 60 years old. I have no comorbidities, uh, but I was complaining about being putting all the distance. Without glasses, I was useless. Uh, my own corrective year was 2060, the yeah, 16 Best corrective was 2020 with a plus two. And this is plus two, it's probably a little bit more. It was plus 225, plus 2.5. And, but believe me, when you look at me with my glasses, I will say, well, people will say, okay, this guy have congenital glaucoma because all these ads and plus will put your eyes like this. So I was tired of being, you know, with these glasses. So I said, okay, it's time for me to get surgery. Of course, I have, I done all the tests in Riyadh. I think I repeat everything in his clinic and everything was fine. We did visual field, we did retina evaluation, we did pentacam, we did everything. But uh, before I arrived to his clinic, and Francois knows this, I had decided to go for an EDOF lens because I know that I have a certain degree of dryness, okay? When I was in the clinic that they run all the tests, I realized that one of the machine was a keratograph. So when I sit with Gerardo to discuss about my surgery, I say, okay, I want to see the results of the keratograph. And this is what it came out. I said, you know what? It was five o'clock in the afternoon, one day before my surgery at nine o'clock in the morning on the next day. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to go for an needle of lens. I will go for a multifocal lens. So immediately we communicate with my friend over there. How they did it, I don't know. But the next day in the morning, the intraocular lenses were there waiting for me. And so as a patient and as a surgeon, when you're going to get multifocal and you decide to go for a multifocal lens, you have 
to putting a balance. Halos, glitter, and everybody knows that any multifocal lens up today is not perfect. And up today, it will decrease the quality of your vision. It will decrease the contrast sensitivity. So why would you go and get something that is going to decrease your quality of your vision? But if you're putting in a balance, you have to see all this coming with a multifocal IOLs and be free of glasses. Of course, I decided to be free of glasses and to go ahead with a multifocal lens. I'm not going to go over this because everybody knows how this uh, multifocal lens fine vision works. And it's an amazing technology that I started using in 2014. And I'm very lucky that I had the possibility to have it available in Argentina. And so this is one of the good things about, and it's a unique technology for the fine vision and prevents this, which is a very disturbing problem when you get multifocal IULs. Of course, I did a little bit more investigation about fine vision, and this is what I found, uh, the technology. Then, how many lenses have been implanted worldwide? And the number are amazing. It's more than one million at this moment. More than 60 countries, including Japan, that was registered in 2022, and more than 60, not 50, 60 peer review papers. Um, it was the first generation as a multifocal lens. People will say, why would you get a hydrophilic lens? For me, it doesn't make any difference. Of course, hydrophobic people, it's going to be a hit debate in between hydrophilic and hydrophobic. But at this moment, I haven't had to remove a hydrophilic because I have an opacification or something. What is important is not the material at this moment. It is the technology that is behind the fine vision multifocal IUL, and that's what I choose to get this lens. As I said, several papers, peer review papers, and this is my surgery. Can you hear the audio of this? I know. I, I must say that I am not an easy person in terms of if I'm going to get a blood test, I will run away from that moment. So imagine for me to get in surgery, it was a big step forward. It was a big decision as a patient and as a surgeon. So something goes wrong, your life or your career is over. So I say, well, but I know that I was in very good hands. And surgery is amazing. This is a topical anesthesia, and in the hands of a great surgeon, it's a very smooth procedure. The only thing you feel is a little pressure every time he goes inside the eye. I told him, be careful. And he said, no, I'm not the most careful doctor in the world. But I say, I know you're a good surgeon. So the surgery went very smooth. The diversity of colors and things that you see when you get the surgery is amazing. Um, after the surgery, I, I was searching and see what was the closest thing that I saw during my surgery that I can put it here um, for the surgery. And it's going to be right after this. So everything perfect. Uh, here you see different colors. Um, I don't recall seeing the instruments, but I do recall seeing a lot of colors and a little bit of pressure. Amazing the moment that you get the lens inside your eye. And it's like somebody is placing a plastic disc into your eyes because you see all these phenomenal rings getting inside your eye. And then, you know, when he positions the lens, it's amazing. Um, it's fascinating what you see. Uh, this is him preparing the lens. Uh, many people will say, uh, this is his comment during the surgery, people will say that implantation of the fine vision is difficult. It's not difficult at all. At all. And you will see it. It's very easy. Um, at that moment, I, he said, I'm going to put the lens. I say, okay, be soft. And 
And this is the moment that you see the placido this coming into your eye. This video was presented in Faco Extrema in Argentina a month ago, or less than a month ago. Uh, and they mentioned this is the first ophthalmology to be presented in Faco Extrema meeting. My experience was so amazing that I recommend to my friend do the surgery because he has high hyperopia as well. Two weeks after that, he got the surgery. And now we have another uh, happy man with the same technology. And basically, this is what you see when you get the surgery. You see multiple colors, you see the light, you see some movement, and you see like this. This is the closest thing that I remember that I found in the internet that I can give it to you so you will have an idea. Whenever you get the surgery, this is what you're gonna feel. Or this is what you're gonna see. This is my post-op three hours after the surgery in a very nice restaurant in Buenos Aires, La Brigada. And this is me with the owner. It doesn't look like the owner, but he's the owner. And this is in his home. The guy to the right is no him, it's his twin brother. This is one week after the surgery. Amazing. I was able to read the label of a different wives that we had that day. Uh, this is my post-op three months after the surgery. And 2020, undercorrected. I am J14 near vision. My intermediate vision is not perfect, but it's more than enough for me to allow me to work in my computer. Uh, if you ask me, do you have any problem related to the lens? I will say yes, but it's not only because of the lens. It's also the material. It's also the technology. All multifocal lenses will have some degrees of either positive dysphotopsias or negative. I do have all of them, okay? But it has been improving now and three months post-op. I still see the halos at night. I still see the rings around the lights. I have the escotomas more in the left than in the right, but it's now, I didn't see it for about two weeks. Yesterday night, I saw it maybe because of the one they gave at the party, maybe, I don't know, but I saw it last night again. And I believe I heard somebody making a very nice comment two days ago. He said, halos and rims in patients who had a multifocal lens is when you get married, your mother-in-law. Your mother-in-law will be in your life forever. You might don't tolerate her at the beginning. And this is when it happens during the first few months after the surgery. But then either you get used to her or she becomes a little bit more soft with you. This is what I am right now. I can do all my activities without any problem. This is a questionnaire that I fill. Um, what was my lifestyle before? Do I, did I used to drive? No, only when it was necessary. And the reason for that is because the way they drive where I live is a little bit complicated. So I prefer to go out with a driver and avoid any accident, even that's before the surgery. After the surgery, i still driving. I have no problems to drive. Um, this is my score for my distant vision. It's a five, intermediate and near. Evaluating my night driving, where I have to drive after the surgery, first one, night driving is the same or better than before treatment. The question is no, and the answer is no. Second one, night driving is worse than before treatment, but it's not a problem for me. The answer is yes. It's worse than before, a big time, but it doesn't prevent me from driving. At the beginning, I was a little bit scared then at all. I, I can drive if I want to without a problem. Do I still depending on glasses? No, I am 100% free of glasses. Considering all the items related to the treatment, I get in a conclusion you, that I feel that I'm very satisfied with the results. Extremely satisfied. And the other question is, will you repeat the treatment? I will say yes, and I will do it 10 years before. Because the technology came in 2011, 10 years before I will do it. If I have to do it, 
instead of waiting until I get 60, I will do it when I get 50. I lost, I, I wore glasses for 17 years. It was a long time. So I will do, expedite the process of the surgery and do it before to reach 60. So the answer for that is a super yes. This is a beautiful picture of the lens. Uh, it was taken here in the, uh, in the Congress. Uh, so my final message is uh, for premium annual implantation, especially for multifocal lenses, uh, look for pre-existing ocular surface disease and look for DID because it will make a difference for you. Spend time with the patient. If you need to optimize the ocular surface before making the measurements, do it. That will make a big difference and that will make a happy patient. If you don't do it, you will have a highly dissatisfied patient after the surgery. Personalize every treatment that you do. Choose the correct intraocular lens for the right person. You have to personalize the treatment. Think about the personality of the patient. This is very, very important. This, uh, and try to optimize the re result. As you know, we try to do the best for every single patient, but make an extra time for people who are going to get a multifocal lens. This is me before the surgery, and this is me after the surgery. It doesn't bother me at all in the surgery. I used to operate with a 30% light in the microscope, and now I tell the nurse, please go to 40 if I feel that I need a little bit of light, but I'm only 40%, no more than that. And I have no problem doing the surgery. And when you are spending the last moment with your patient before deciding for the surgery, under promise, do no sell, just under promise and over deliver. Thank you for all your attention.